Welcome to Sky Fashion Hub 2020 from the Braylon Pavilion. Thank you for joining us. As we all know, global health precautions, quarantine measures and border closures continue to interrupt daily life. Times are uncertain and the world seems to have gone temporarily awry. At Sky, we're trying to take adversity in our stride and creatively problem solve. Over the coming months, Sky will broadcast a content-rich, for the most part Australia-focused, visually compelling virtual suite of conversations, all within the context of our usual hub format. Our cast of designers, makers, writers, authors, academics, theorists, gallerists, curators, museum leaders, activists and philanthropists are currently and progressively being filmed. We hope their wisdom and expertise will provide both inspiration and comfort to you at this trying time. Be well, be kind and above all, be safe. something that my father did at the dinner table because there was a tradition of family uh, family dinners and everybody around the table was supposed uh, to bring some kind of entertainment at the end of the meal we were supposed to sing or you were supposed to recite something or you were supposed to be uh, <coughs> entertaining so this was his form of entertainment. You have, to, you have to understand that in a tangerine, it is too important point. So he would, nobody, understand, uh, nobody understood why, but he would draw a little figure, right? The head and the neck and the breast, and at the other end here, which was which was an important point, you had the sex, right? You have to understand that you had the sex, and then later on you had the legs, right? The knees, and and uh, and uh, the calves uh, and the feet, right? Now, when th when this drawing was made, right, like this. When this drawing was made, you were supposed to take a razor blade and cut it, right? Cut it like this, all around. So you ended up by lifting, right? By lifting the little figure. And you are going to see that this little figure is more interesting than she appears to be. So you lift up here the thighs, right? You lift up the thighs, thighs, right? Like this. You have to cut it and you lift it, right? And then you then, are you looking now? Yes. Yes, this is the important thing. You lift it, you extract it, right, at this point, right? And you see what is going to happen. You see that I know my job, because you are going to see what, what is coming. You see what is coming? You see this? Right. So, you see this? This is a little penis. Now, this whole story was addressed to me at the dinner table in front of everybody, right? And my father, who directed his uh, stupid humor towards me, would say, Oh, this little figure is so pretty. I think she's my daughter, right? She's my daughter. Right. You see this little figure? 
how sweet she is. I thought she was my daughter, but obviously she's not my daughter because my daughter has nothing there. So I would blush. I would, I would die on the spot in front of everybody. You know, I was not a man. I was, it's a feminist statement, I was not a man, I was only a woman who didn't have anything there. So it is a certain kind of humor, and it is a kind of humor which I've, I find detestable, but that uh, my father appreciated. So everybody would burst out laughing. Right? That's all, that's uh, the whole story. So, but you see how, how successful this is it. This is because something sometimes there is nothing there. So you have it. I'm almost hesitant to <laughs> to rake the, over the coals again. But Francis, yeah. I think you know not everybody who's listening to this uh, comes from inside the art world or has had the uh, privilege and the yeah. benefit of an art historical education. And uh, we do know that uh, Louise Bourgeois had a very fraught um, a domestic uh, child, a childhood. A do her domestic situation was uh, troubled and that she dealt with um, the difficulties really I mean, dying at 99, she was still going to her analyst uh, yeah. on a regular basis. Yeah. So you don't go to your yeah. analyst. I thought you would go just out of interest, but I think <clears throat> most people go because there's an element of pain in them, that they want yeah. to somehow assuage or remove or, uh, you know, get rid of. So um, what was, what happened Well, at she, home? as I said, affluent, affluent family, loving mother and father. Yes. Yeah. After the First World War, her mother contracted the great European flu that killed so many people, mm. devastated much of the world, and was really an invalid from that time on. Mm -hmm. um, in order to support Louise and her brother and sister, the family hired a nanny, mm -hmm. a young English woman called Sadie, mm -hmm. who not only looked after the children but had a long-term and very um, open affair with the father, mm. Louis Bourgeois. So she was brought up in a situation where loving mother, loving father and mistress, a triangle. Mm. And that, the, 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 the sadness of that, the anxiety of that, the trauma of that, alongside her mother's illness and early death, mm. really shaped. Uh, Louise's whole life. And mm. It's interesting that she, or even in her, you know, late years, she 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 knew she needed she needed psychoanalysis. Yes. She needed the therapy. Yes. Uh, she needed the, the experience. She needed the memory. She never wanted to be cured. I don't think all, therapy all that, ever cures anyone. Experience. <laughs> no. That experience yeah. Fed all her work. Yes. Her work on relationships. Her work on motherhood. Yes. Her work on childhood her attitude to men and women, yes. her attitude to siblings, and, and so on and so and forth. So, so although it was a tragedy, it was also a gift yes, for an artist who was a storyteller. Yes, she was a storyteller. What I read, and this surprised me because I'd known earlier about the father and the uh, affair and the nanny, but uh, in some of the articles I read in preparation for this talk, uh, it appeared that he was a womanizer outside of the nanny as well. So it wasn't just the nanny replacing the mother who, uh, you know, perhaps couldn't fulfill the wifely functions that were uh, expected in that situation. So it sounded as though there was an element of abusiveness in him. So he was he loving and abusive? <laughs> was he? Uh, well, <laughs> who's to okay. know? He was a friend. He was a friend. A good-looking French man yes. of a certain age uh, yes. at a certain point in time in the 20th century. Yes, I see. He was also somebody that travelled for work because he was visiting Chateau I across see. the country to buy second-hand and, and damaged tapestries. Tapestry. He dealt in, in medieval tapestry. Yes. So, and he was also a very, very charming man. Yes. And I think uh, Bourgeois was both... Uh, in, she adored him... And she was also destroyed by him. Yes. So it was a very, very psychologically abusive relationship. Yes. And in the 70s, she made some really 
really moving work about about him, one extraordinary piece called The Destruction of the Father, uh-huh. where she imagined the, the family dining table and her father's dominance of that realm. I think he was a very dominating, yes, charismatic, yes. powerful man. And um, she was, it was, all of them lived in fear, but in love for him too. Yes, it's, a, it's um, again, uh, the resonances for me personally and for many people, I'm sure, and particularly in that era where fathers and husbands could get away with it more easily, uh, you know, just little wife keep quiet kind of thing and uh, listen to me. I don't know much about her husband, Professor Robert Goldwater. Can you tell us anything about him? He was a, an art professor, but what, what did he do? What was his area? Well, Robert Goldwater was a very renowned professor uh-huh. of the history of art. Yes. And who wrote a very, se- wrote very seminal work on primitivism. Uh-huh. And both, both the primitive in relation to tribal art yes. and the art of Global South, but also primitivism in relation to early uh, 20th century or, or 19th century European art. Like uh-huh. Years ago when I did, um, I worked, I did an exhibition of Henri Rousseau. Uh-huh. Long, long before the bourgeois um, uh, exhibition. Yes. And one of the absolutely best texts I read Yes. Even of all the literature on um, Rousseau was by Robert Goldwater. How interesting. So he, he was much older than Bourgeois yes. and he was highly regarded and very well known in both the academic but also the fine art milieu in America. So she married an older man who was much, much more famous than her. Yes. And one of the interesting things I think, uh, well, I'm pretty sure of, one could never talk about this during Louise's lifetime, is that she was so she was profoundly influenced by primitive and tribal art. Uh-huh. She was, and you can see it. You can see it in her Ernest. Oh culture. yes, now that you she say it, I see art. it. Yes, yes. Yeah, she must have spent a lot of time in the Met. Yes. looking at the collection there, and I'm sure that that interest was kindled by her relationship with Robert Goldwater. Yes, Francis, I can't help yeah. myself. I've got. I found a, a quote. Uh, um, by a feminist uh, woman who I'd not heard of before called Anita Steckel, uh, S-T-E-C-K-E-L, who um, uh, headed up and founded a collective called the Anti-Censorship Collective, and I am determined somehow to get this quote into this conversation, and then I promise you (laughs) there'll be a question coming out of it. This is what Anita Steckel said. If the erect penis is not wholesome enough to go into museums, it should not be considered wholesome enough to go into women. I just thought that's it. I love it. Love it. (laughs) Can we move on, though, from the exhibitions to the Tate, uh, which I'm going to do uh, in a few moments with Magdalena as well, and talk about Maman, the mother, and the huge uh, nine-metre high steel and marble work, which I never saw, sadly, created in 99, and that really set the stage and was the inaugural work for uh, the opening of the uh, Tate Modern and the Turbine Hall series, which everybody looks so forward to every year and which I last saw with Cara Walker's work, which was the, the last one, I think. So how did that happen? Were you, where were you at the time in 1990? Well, I, I know was, you were at the Tate, but what were you doing? I was uh, a part of a very small curatorial team. There were just three of us yes. charged with opening Tate Modern. Uh-huh. Oh, ha- having the, creating the programme that opened Tate Modern. Yes. And so apart from the, installing the collection... We had this idea that we would like to do annual commissions in the Turbine Hall. Mm. And Louise Bourgeois was the, just seemed to us the ideal starter. Because yes. she was the kind of oldest of young artists and the youngest of old. Uh-huh. Her career, you know, tr- uh, covered the century almost. Yes. She went through all those isms. She was totally unique and she was a great female voice. So, she was like a, you know, she was like, I don't know, she was like the mascot of, yes. of Tate Modern at that yes. moment. We, we, 
We love this idea. And she made four sculptures, in fact, for that opening. Uh -huh. She made three huge towers, which you could walk up and down. Yes. And they were uh, um, almost like little houses. They were called I Do, I Undo, I Redo. Uh -huh. And they spoke to Louise's long, lifelong obsession with um, relationships and with the way we uh, go through periods of closeness and distance and break up, and we make, repair, we undo. Mm. Very, very beautiful metaphors for the way we live our lives. But, of course, the great centrepiece was this huge spider yes. called Mammon. Mammon. What I loved about that spider, 1999, Louise's first drawing of a spider she made in 1947. Good heavens. So the piece spoke oh. to this lifelong obsession yes. with the image of the spider, who Louise very much represented for her her mother. But spiders are often because seen as frightening, you know, creatures to be, especially in Australia, I can assure you, that everybody but, you know, has in their homes a book of dangerous spiders. So in a way, for me, it's quite, I understand the weaving side of it, but, you know, there's another layer of meaning attached to spiders. Well, you have to remember that um, spiders, are, are, they give birth. They give that spiders die when they give birth. Ah. They exist to bring life. Ah. So there's something very poignant there. Spiders are oh. generated new life and give their lives. And their whole their whole life exists to support the life cycle. So there is something very, very poignant when you think about Louise's own experience of her mother, who she adored who she respected, mm. who she learned from, but who also died young died and young. gave her. Yes. But of course, I think that also, we're all, aren't we all a little bit scared of our mothers? <laughs> I was more scared of my father, I think. <laughs> uh, we're not going to go <laughs> into that conversation. <laughs> She's 89 and I'm still scared of her. <laughs> but you're right. Well, I mean, I think, I think Louise Bourgeois is is an artist who never puts us at our ease. No, no. There's always that double edge. It's yes. always male and female. Yes. It's always love and hate. It's always life yes. and death. And the spider is exactly that. It's some she nurtures us. Yes. But she also creates traps for us. Exactly. She entraps us. Yes. She entraps <laughs> us. And she devours us. Exactly. Oh, well, I think we've exhausted that within the confines of this uh, short talk. Finally, and certainly not, uh, you know, last but certainly not least, Magdalena, where I'm on shakier ground, I did do my homework, but um, we've, I think, explained quite a lot about uh, Poland and her aristocratic background. At Yalta, before the war's end, the big three, the United States, Russia and England, discussed Poland's future. Throughout history, Joseph Stalin said, Poland had been a corridor through which Russia's enemies had attacked her. Thus, the Soviet Union must annex eastern Poland, and in exchange, Poland was to get part of eastern Germany. These boundary changes were made, but free Polish elections, also part of the Yalta Agreement, were never held. Poland, already occupied by the Red Army, was taken over by Polish communists, backed by Soviet power. Thus, the post-war years revealed Joseph Stalin's grand design, the reason the Red Army had refused to help the Polish underground. They were not communists. Um, you're right in saying that, particularly under the, the years of Stalin, life was very, very difficult. I mean, it wasn't just the fact that there was a, they were living within the Soviet uh, regime, but of course the uh, Second World War took a huge toll on the economy yes. um, and infrastructure of Europe. One of the things that was very evident at that time that I think Magdalena became very conscious of only later was just how incredibly um, polluting 
the uh, uh, you know the extractive industries were at that time. So mm. coal, for example. So you can imagine that, that they weren't just living in uh, very suppressed circumstances in small apartments um, without much uh, income, uh, with very few uh, consumer goods, but also the air was filthy. Mm. The acid rain was polluting mm. uh, the lakes and the forests. And for somebody like Magdalena, who was absolutely had been captivated as a child by nature, that would have been a very, very oppressive situation. Mm. But I think it is also worth pointing out that one of the we talk about, you know, the the, the grayness, and of course we're, we're we're seeing this through black and white photography. Yes, that is our memory of this. Yes, era. Black that's and white right. Black and white. Mm. But the very very strong folk traditions yes. across the whole of Eastern Europe did ensure that the kind of ethnographic and folk tradition was brilliantly coloured. Yes. And so when you look at Magdalena's weavings, yes. they're very strong colours. Yes. She was taught the very best techniques of uh, how you make uh, natural dye, how you dye your, your cloth. So I, I think we need to balance that sense of drabness yes. with actually a sense of the brilliance of the folk tradition yes. and how that informed the work of this extraordinary generation, actually a po Polish uh, fiber artists. Yes, I'd like to uh, uh, really for people again who haven't had the benefit of and the privilege of an art historical background for you to describe these abacans because those are her sort of key works, the hero yes, works, yes. and the works that if one knows anything about Magdalena, you would know yes. about the abacans. Yeah, what because what the, were they, of, Francis? Well, the, the abacans are very large-scale woven sculptures. Mm. And I use that word sculpture because Abakanovich was one of the first artists working in weaving who understood that you could make weavings that could occupy space mm. just as sculptures did. Yeah. She did that by making works that had internal framing devices mm. and could be hung from the ceiling. Mm. And she made them using a combination of traditional weaving techniques, mm. so with a traditional loom, but by innovating the way she used the weft. The warp is the vertical, yes. and the weft is the horizontal. Mm. And by putting the weft in a particular way, yes. she was able to create bulging fabrics rather than flat fabrics. I see. So when you look at the work, they have a very kind of organic bodily feel yes. to them um, that feels very human. Uh, they're very evocative of bodies, of organic things, yes. forms of growth. She, The materials she used in making her weavings were both conventional, but also she would weave into her, um, her weavings uh, ropes and sisal and paper and, and wool in a very kind of liberated way without regard for tradition. So it's a kind of combination of very, um, she really understood weaving. She yes, understood that clearly, technique. yes. But, but once you understand your technique, you know how to innovate exactly. and play with it. Yeah. So she was making work that really had sculptural ambition but in a format that had traditionally only made flat art. Yes. And nobody quite knew how to describe these. They didn't know whether they were sculptures yes. or weavings or fiber art, and that's why they became known as abacans. I see. Because did the, she you know, call them abacans, or did other people? No, that was, I, I, other people called them I abacans. See. I see. I don't know who began that. Uh -huh. it, it became almost a, a word for a, a type of work that could not be categorized uh -huh. according to conventional means. And do you think that, I mean, uh, making these weavings uh, curved as opposed to flat, she had to uh, make, develop or invent a new loom? I mean, how? No, 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 no. Interestingly, uh, interestingly the, uh, the, the way she made them was with a large-scale conventional womb Oh, yeah. sorry, loom. <laughs> That's a Freudian slip. <laughs> They're very womb-like. But in a, in a conventional loom, you have your you set up your warp. Yeah. These strong vertical lines. Yeah. 
And then you do your whip weft. Yeah. And then you pull down. I don't know what it's called, but there's like a little bit of wood that flattens yes, everything. Yes, I've seen it. And you it. go on the line. So what Magdalena did, she didn't flatten everything. She just pulled down the edges, allowing oh, the center. Oh, I see. A, a sort of curve, curve to so emerge. You belly. Uh, you get a belly. Uh -huh. And then when you finish, you hang, you turn it up. And that belly becomes a great elliptical curve. Ah, I see. So they're able to sew two or four together, yes. and you get these almost like I mean, they're terribly sexual. Yeah. They're like labia or lips. They yes. are astonishingly vaginal. Yes. And what I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> Abakanovich. I never know. I know. Uh, where, where to put the yeah. emphasis? But uh, Abakanovich, I would. Abakanovich. Uh huh. She never talked about the sexuality. Yes. But I think that because she was of that generation. Yes. But they are so profoundly sexual in my view. Yes. Yes. They, I mean, they're very figurative when you think of the abstraction very, that came very. before. These really do look like bodies, and uh, yeah, but, uh, and the inside of a body. And they, the they're inside. Like, um, they're, they're apertures. Yes. And I think when she made them, she very much wanted people to walk around them and even in some cases into them. Yes. So they all become um, um, enclosures. So you walk into the kind of the womb. The womb, or, yes, or the I see. Or yes. The nest. Yes. They're very, she talked about, she loved, she loved the idea of softness. Yes. She was, in, you know, nurturing. Yes. Sheltering. Yes. Warmth. Yes. He's very human. And I wonder whether that came from the trauma of, 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 of living through that awful period of the war. Yes. No, look, I think it uh, obviously affected people in different ways. But women, you know, uh, biologically we're supposed to be inclined in that direction and then it can be intensified. And what about her relationship with Sheila Hicks, for example? Uh, and, well, you know, that's, yes, that mm. is interesting. I mean, she... Well, interestingly, Sheila Hicks knew Annie Albers. Yes. Uh, because she was at Yale when... When uh, Annie Albers, Albers was... Uh, Joseph was teaching there, yes. I, there, was, there was a very important exhibition at MoMA in 1969 called Wall Hangings. Yes. And uh, they were all in it. Annie yes. Albers, Abakanovich, and interestingly, yes. Louise Bourgeois reviewed that uh, exhibition. Ah. And Louise, Louise Bourgeois was very uh, unimpressed ah. because she said that she didn't see, she didn't think any of the artists had understood the architectural and sculptural potential of fibre art. Wow. And of course the tragedy <laughs> was that the exhibition was installed in a very conventional way. I see. Had the curators installed Abakanovich in three dimensions Yes. and Annie Albers as a room divider, yes. Bourgeois would have had a completely different vision. Yes. But when you look then at the experience of Lenore Tawney, her impact on Agnes Martin, you think of the great Indian uh, fibre artist, Marilena Mukherjee, the, these artists were all looking at Abakanovich yes. and Annie Albert. Yes. Profoundly influential. Yes. Both, both their work seen... Uh, in real life, in exhibitions, but also in in publications. Yeah. So, of course, that you know that book by Annie Albers in '65 was absolutely. This is on weaving. She was a, a very weaving. accomplished writer, apparently. Yeah, yeah. Yes, I've beautiful. Never, uh, yeah, beautiful writer, precise and accomplished, and uh, yeah. uh, you know, uh, uh, original. I, my final question really relates to research that I did in relation to my own doctorate, uh, which we briefly uh, alluded to when we spoke on the phone, and that is uh, the research on myth, myth-making. I did have to um, really uh, delve into myth-making uh, in the Old Testament and André Gide's work, which was uh, the subject <coughs> of my thesis. But I, I had to read uh, people like Jung, which took me to Freud. And then I read, um, he was Romanian-born. I, I think he lived most of his life in France. Uh, I'm not 100% sure about that comment. A writer called Mircea Eliad, uh, M-I-R-C-E-A and Eliad, E-L-I-A-D-E, 
for me, there is so much of Eliad's thinking in Abakamovich's work, just that mm. idea of getting to the essential myths uh, that all humankind share. You know, we all have uh, myths about um, uh, creation and myths about um, passing and myths about the afterlife and so on. I haven't ever seen anything by Magdalena in real life, only on the screen and in mm. uh, in books. But would you say, I mean, that was my response and has been my response since I've done a bit of research on her, that there's a kind of essentialness or essential element yeah. to her. Yes, her. yes. Mm. I, think, I think so. And I, I mean, I, again, um, I think that, relates to her childhood mm. in the forests and yes. in the ancient traditions of yes. Polish storytelling and mythology. Yes. And not so much, well, partly her fibre work, but also later on when she came to make sculpture first in wood and then in bronze, mm. there is a sense of a sort of oneness of humanity yes. with nature. That's what I'm you talking about. Yes. yes. And... Um, it's one of the reasons that the work still speaks today. Yes. I, again, paradoxically, it's, it's deep, deep embeddedness in ancient mythology yes. allows it to have a continued relevance, just yes. as Louise Bourgeois' uh, enormous fascination and knowledge of Freudian psychoanalysis yes. that underpins her work and her writings also makes it so accessible today. Exactly. And, I mean, you have the myth of Andromeda, the weaver, uh, yeah. uh, who, uh, uh, you know, out of, coming out of Greek mythology, who angered the gods and was turned into a spider. So I think you have yeah. all these myths embedded. Well, I think there are these broad historical bands of interconnection. Yes. So that, that generation of... It's a generation of artists who were children during the Second World, World War. World War, yes. So they, they, they experienced the... Second World War firsthand, yes. but as children. Yes. So they didn't understand it. And then what they really went through was the traumas and the hardships of the post war years. Yeah. Pillars of a brave new world, ages from three to six and not even able to stand. Rickets. Age nine. Mother tortured, father burned alive. Age 10, lost her senses when shells swept her Dutch village. Age 8, mother, father, sister and brother killed all around him in deliberate shell fire because they refused to leave the shelter of a ravine, himself wounded. Age 8, she didn't know her strange new toy was a grenade. Ages 10 to 14. Age 3. Stunted and warped by nutritional deficiencies. Pillars of the brave new world. Separated from parents whose names they don't even remember. Roaming like wolf packs, stealing, begging, education neglected, all normal influence gone, living in filth, and millions more like them, from which will emerge new leaders, new leaders who also will bear the burden of keeping the peace together, for here too, as well as in more fortunate nations, are makers of tomorrow. Will they be new Einsteins, Toscaninis, Manuel Quezons, Madame Curies, Sun Yat-sens, 